A day on the ski slopes turns into every parent's nightmare. Come on, man. Let's go. Stranded in an icy wilderness, hopes of rescue fade. A father faces a heartbreaking choice. I'm gonna die. To wait for rescue or go for help, leaving his young son alone in a frozen cave on the mountain. Hardest decision I've ever made to leave a child of mine behind. Kartal Kaya, a mountain ski resort in northwest Turkey. We had the boots, then you laced up. US Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Mike Couillard is taking a few hours off to go skiing with his two sons. Well, we have a lot of snowball fights. Mark is 12 years old. Don't hit me in the head. Matthew is 10. The family is based in Turkey, where Mike is part of Operation Provide Comfort. After the first Gulf War, the American Air Force flew thousands of missions to protect the Kurds of northern Iraq. While Mike takes the boys skiing, his wife Mary stays at home with daughter Marisa. A lot of people we know are going but it's mostly dads and their sons. And I'll stay back and I'll keep Marie. So got you all myself tonight. Mike and Matthew can hang out and and uh, Mark can be with his friends and it'll be a great father son day. For Mike, today's a rare break from duty and an opportunity for a boys day out. He and the boys are traveling from their home in the Turkish capital, Ankara, up to the remote mountain resort of Kartal Kaya. By American standards, Kartal Kaya is not a real big mountain. It's about 6,000 feet. We'd been there once, and we hadn't really totally explored the mountain, but it was uh, you know, certainly a good place for us to go with the family. What a great time for uh, my sons and I to get some bonding time. Get out of it. Matthew's got a quiet strength and uh, heart of gold, and just cares about people. Mark's always been, the, you know, very curious one, very adventurous. After lunch, Mike and Matthew head back up the mountain, while Mark stays behind to ski with his friends. Matthew and I were together, and Mark and his friends gonna go on their own for a while. He said that him and Matt were gonna ski together, and that was the last time I saw him that day. Tired? Are you? We were pretty tired from skiing all day, and the resort was about to close, so we decided to go on one last run, and take three different lifts all the way up to the top of the mountain. We've been skiing in Colorado where you have a nice sunny day and then you see these uh, wispy clouds rolling around the top of the mountain and that's kind of what it was starting to look like. The weather at the top was much worse than at the bottom. The mountain of Kartel Kaya is rarely welcoming. And by the time Mike and Matthew reach the top of the lift, a solid bank of fog has rolled in from the Black Sea. Locals call it the Mister. It produces a whiteout, and the ski slope back down to the resort is no longer visible. There's two different paths you could take, the left or the right. It just was getting harder and harder to keep sight of the trail. Snow just kept getting thicker and thicker. We started to realize that no one skied down this hill in quite some time. We've lost the lift. I think it's over there. Half the side. 
sidestep up the slope. Realizing that they've skied down the wrong way, Mike and Matthew start climbing back up the hill. I kept thinking that we would get to the top of the hill, we'd look down and see the resort, the hotel, the wide open expanse, and we just found another hill up, up in front of us. Dad, we're so lost. Instead of going back up the way they came down, Mike has led his son round to the far side of the mountain. They're heading away from the ski resort into an icy wilderness. Probably by now it's between 3.30 and 4, and it's already starting to look like the sun's going down and it's getting, getting on towards twilight. Dad, you okay? It's okay. I'm good. Down at the ski resort, the bus home is about to leave. Mark hasn't seen his dad and brother since lunchtime. Uh, when I got to the bus, my brother and dad weren't there. So I figure, you know, the bus will have to wait a minute, but they'll show up, and uh, they didn't. We've gone miles by now. I just knew we could go on. Matthew was a, just totally exhausted, cold and soaking wet. We were in a complete whiteout and the temperature was dropping by the minute. I just couldn't believe the situation I'd gotten myself into. I mean, it was like one moment we were, we were having a nice time skiing in the sun and then the next we were facing this terrible situation. We're already looking at darkness and, and uh, we're still not anywhere close to being able to connect with this bus. Close to exhaustion, Mike and Matthew struggle on through heavy snow for seven hours. As the temperature on the mountain drops, hypothermia and frostbite become a real danger. As the bus drove away, it was pretty much that moment when I knew that something was really wrong and I didn't know if I would see them ever again. The darkness on the mountain closes in as the blizzard rages on. Mike has no idea which way to go or whether to keep Matthew moving. We can't keep doing this. He's just done, and I can't carry him. I make this decision anyway. Let's stop. Hello, Mary. It's Wanda. At the ski resort, Mike's colleague, Major Wanda Villiers, is looking after Mark. Look, Mary, there's a bit of a problem. My friend Wanda was on the phone, and she said that Mike and Matthew had not come down off the mountain. Well, where are they? Well, we just don't know. I've had a lot of survival training. You know, I knew how to make a shelter. And so I decided to go up. The, the slope a bit and see if I can find a good tree to spend the night underneath. Just took my ski and wove it in between the branches, put our ski poles in there, and branches off the surrounding trees and just wove those in and it made kind of like a little roof. The lion's share of your body temperature can be soaked up by just laying on cold ground. So it's very important to get a layer of pine boughs underneath us. What comes from the back of my mind, like a ton of bricks, uh, is the full weight of the situation. Hey, we're gonna be out here. Despite the conditions, a search and rescue team is sent onto the mountain. As I was looking out the window, kind of hoping I would see them coming down the mountain, I could hear the loudspeakers playing Turkish pop music on all the ski runs, hoping that my dad and brother would hear it and find, uh, find the hotel. By now, it's uh, late into the night, and you know, I'm just thinking, you know, how is Marion gonna take this news that we haven't come back? As we're settling in, I'm formulating a plan. What am I gonna do tomorrow? Because uh, tomorrow's gotta go on, and we've gotta get, our, get ourselves out of this mess. 
Mike and Matthew have passed a night on the mountain in a howling blizzard and freezing temperatures. Mike had decided they should stay put. As dawn breaks, their survival depends on being found soon. sort of kept it from Arisa that they didn't come down off the mountain. Where's Dad? Come and sit down here. But I know it's morning now and the phone hasn't rung in the middle of the night. So I have to tell her. With daylight, special forces from Mike's airbase swing into action. This time their job is not to protect the Kurds, but to look for one of their own. Turkish troops, with their local knowledge, join the operation. Mike's commanding officer is leading it. Hello? Mary, it's Ed Fitzgerald here. I just wanted to update you on the situation. Mike's colonel lets me know that the search has already started, that people are actually looking for them. He's going to coordinate the search from the uh, lodge there at the ski resort. The search makes national news, but it's focusing on the area surrounding the ski slopes. Mike and Matthew are in fact miles away. After an uncomfortable night, Matthew awakes cold, wet, and still exhausted. We woke up kind of groggy that morning. I, I think because we had slept off and on the whole night. In the daylight, I was able to see there was like uh, an opening in the rock. Mike's survival training kicks in. When lost, find shelter and stay where you are. It's a cave. We've been sitting on top of it all night. Come on, son. They can stay in the cave and wait to be rescued. Survival. Give people a chance to find us. Yeah? They'll be looking for us right now. How will they find us? The snow will stop soon. They'll find us. I knew there were certain things that I could do to enhance our chances of being seen just took my skis and planted them as a big X, the international distress signal for skiers. I just hoped that there would be people come up and see those, and they saw the skis, and they would be able to find us. Mike and Matthew have been in freezing temperatures for 24 hours. The cave offers protection from the blizzard outside, but little else. It was at that point I realized I was already getting that first warning sign of frostbite, which is this little white callus uh, build up on your hands, kind of a waxy look. Here, let's get this off. 
these boots were not doing a good job of keeping our feet warm. Let's get the wet sock off. Having looked at my own hands and seen the condition I was in, I decided, you know, maybe I'd investigate Matthew's feet. Dad, I can't feel my toes. He was starting to experience some of the first stages of frostbite there on his feet, too. Look at your toes. Get the circulation going. That's it. I'm not gonna put your boots back on. Here, give me your scarf. Inside the cave was cold enough for water to freeze. The temperature uh, dropped below freezing. Let's get this one off. Here we are in this tiny cave, this little crack in the mountain, in a raging blizzard. And we're both in the early stages of frostbite. If we didn't get help, we were just going to die on this mountain. The ground search is cooled off as night falls. It can't begin again until morning. Thanks a lot. I'm getting phone calls. Um, well, it started out once a day, but that just wasn't enough. No news yet, honey. There's just too many hours where we didn't know what was going on, and so you get your hopes tweaked every once in a while, and it just seems like all the little hopes just get, keep getting put out. One of our immediate needs was just keeping ourselves hydrated. The bottom line was that you really shouldn't be eating snow. Better stop. Don't eat anymore. You gradually lower your body temperature to the point where you get hyperthermic, and you're making your situation worse by just trying to keep yourselves alive. What was that? Just a small animal, nothing to worry about. Remember when we were in the Mediterranean? Uh, Italian food. And you and Mark, you just wanted to eat burgers. Yeah. Dad, I thought they would have come for us by now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they'll find us tomorrow. Yeah. That was real fun. It was nice to just focus a little bit on those little stories of the day and get our mind off this terrible situation that we're in. As dawn breaks on the mountain, the storm clears. Thanks. I will. See you, Mark. Snowplows have opened the way to the resort, and Mark is able to get home. I'm keeping sane because I'm thinking Mike would never leave Matthew. I'm thinking he's had survival training. Dad, I'm real hungry. I'm realizing they probably don't have food, but maybe some of the snacks they took, they just had stuffed in their pockets. It's our last one. A shot of adrenaline took over, and I all action again. I scrambled outside, and uh, to my amazement, this helicopter just literally seemed like it was flying out of the mist. But as suddenly as this helicopter appeared out of the mist, it was gone. And it was almost a hopeless case. I just was too far down into this little valley to be seen. The good news was I knew they were looking. And I knew they would be back. The helicopters called in for the search were actually part of Operation Provide Comfort. 
pretty sophisticated helicopters, and I was just so excited that they were able to get something besides people on the ground looking for them. Quick, Matt, we might come back. Dad, I can't get my boot on. It's so fit. I'll help you. see this Black Hawk was a solid sign that they were putting everything into the search. I knew that would be a challenge if they ever came back, that uh, I'd, I'd have to figure out a better way to be spotted. How's your feet? I can't feel them. About every 30 minutes to an hour, I would take his feet and put them on my belly and let the core body temperature warm him up. It was also an opportunity to periodically check and see how his feet were doing, and I could see that they were still getting worse. How about that? You want to try standing up, get the circulation going? Oh. That, that, let's just stay here. Mike can't carry Matthew to safety. I'm gonna take your boot, okay? So he pins all his hopes on rescue. I figured, use these boots that he's probably not gonna use. It's bright and sunny outside and it just seemed like now might be a good time to go and do a little more exploring. Mike knows that the improved weather will make the search easier but they're hard to spot down amongst the trees. I had to do everything in my power to get them to see me. And if I was to be seen, I needed to get up above where we were. And I, I thought, you know, if I could go across the stream and climb up on top of that ridge, I figured it'd be a, a lot easier to be spotted. But climbing to the top of the ridge would mean leaving Matthew alone. And Mike's not prepared to consider doing that yet. The search is still concentrated around the resort. Mike and Matthew are miles away, on the other side of the mountain. That's the fourth day, and all of a sudden we heard this helicopter sound. Helicopter. I didn't have much time to get outside. I didn't even have time to put my boots on. seemingly out of nowhere. I could even see the American flag painted on the side. It just flew right over the top of us and was gone. It never made two passes. Mike realizes that the helicopters aren't looking for them where they are. They're flying over on their way to a search grid on the other side of the mountain. My hopes took a plunge into despair. <laughs> Matt, listen, there's a ridge I'm going to try and get to the top of. Maybe see a way out. What's the point? Matt, we got to stay positive. Matt, stay out of it! Dad, you're wrong! We're never going to get out of here. We're going to die here. Mike now faces the unthinkable. Matthew can't move. Mike won't leave without him. But if they wait to be rescued, they may die together. Mike's survival strategy is to wait to be found. He thinks the ski resort, and therefore rescue, is close by and visible from the top of the ridge. But as the days pass, his and Matthew's conditions are deteriorating. 
I kind of did this morbid calculation that, you know, it'd be better to come back without my feet than not at all. I kept putting myself in that situation where I've left a family behind without a father. I just couldn't face the reality of that. I found myself looking at Matthew as he lay there sleeping, and um, he just looked so peaceful, almost like a little angel as he lay there sleeping. And I became aware of just how fragile he was. One of the new developments is the Office of Special Investigations is coming over. Well, they just wanted pictures, you know, and as current as I could get them. They're talking about putting things in the paper. And I'm wondering, are they trying to figure out if they've found the bodies, what they would look like or something? Next morning, during his daily explorations, Mike, though weakened by the cold and lack of food, decides to tackle the ridge. We're hearing helicopter sounds for a long time. They've come by and they've flown directly overhead, but primarily they're over in this one area. That's probably where the ski resort is. They've done the calculation. How far is a father and a 10-year-old child going to go? I tried it several times, and it seemed every time I did that, there were big boulders and trees falling, and I just could not get up on top of this ridge. Yeah, I, I understand. But we still have the Hueys, right? The search is winding down. The American military withdraws, leaving the Turkish soldiers to continue using less sophisticated aircraft. Colonel Fitzgerald was telling me that they're going to um, change the type of helicopter that they're going to have out, and it's just going to map out the area where they think they are so that they can go back and find their bodies in the spring. Mike and Matthew's disappearance is still a major news story. Colonel Fitzgerald calls a press conference in the resort hotel. If uh, we do not find any more information uh, in the next 24 to 36 hours, then we may consider uh, stopping the search and assume for this particular location that the bodies are underneath the snow. I'm just infuriated at that thought because I just don't think they're gone. I shouldn't give up. Um, can I get you a, a cup? Colonel Fitzgerald has come over to the house. They want to look at the options again, Mary. He's talking about, well, maybe they skied over a ridge and didn't even realize in the dark. It's kind of snow coverage. He's got pictures of all this tons and tons of snow and you can't even tell trees are trees, and of course it is pretty, um, pretty bad looking. Mike wouldn't leave Matt. They're waiting for us to find them. Yes, but I don't know, I just feel like I should have a sense if they're gone that I would know it. Mike's first attempt to reach the top of the ridge has failed but he knows that getting there offers the one chance he has of saving Matthew. They didn't come. When we get out of here, I'm gonna buy you the, the biggest hamburger you've ever seen. A basket of fries. A bucket of coke. You know what, Dad? Really? What I want is a pizza.
Well, the Turkish government had decided to do one last big push, and they were going to send out 500 Turkish commandos to search for Mike and Matthew. I just can't believe the amount of people involved in searching for them. And on the other hand, I'm worried if they think they're just looking for bodies, and it's hard to keep being hopeful. Silence on the mountain. There's been no sign of rescue helicopters for days. Mike realizes that staying put is not going to get them rescued. But Matthew can't move, and his condition is getting even worse. I was not pleased with what I saw. Even more of this waxy, gray flesh that was not good. As careful as I was being, it was still not enough. <laughs> Feel that? No, I can't feel anything. A helicopter, Dad. Sounds like a Huey. It's not worth it, son. It's too far away. The Turkish government's last search attempt has found no signs of Mike and Matthew. The rescue team doubts they could have survived for seven days in these conditions. The search is cooled off. Dad? Uh-huh. Will I still be able to kick a ball? Your foot's gonna be fine, son. I've got another question. Go on. What's it like to, you know, to die? I didn't want him going there. You're not gonna die. But I sort of had to deal with that. I felt like if this gets worse and worse and worse and we look at death, I need to prepare him for that. Friday afternoon, my friend Wanda comes in and she says that they're thinking of sending Mark and Maurice and I back to the States. Maybe it's time we think about getting you guys home to be near family. This is my family, Wanda. I am adamant that I'm not going. After seven days, I began to wonder, well, how long will I even have the use of these hands? I decided to start writing a note to my family. It'd sure be nice to tell the people I love, uh, like my wife and family, you know, how I feel about them. Do you want me to write anything from you? Okay. Matthew has just got that tender heart. Tell Marissa, I wish I hadn't fought with her so much. He's a real quiet kid, but he's deep too, and th that love is coming out in, in his words. Tell Mom she's a good cook. Yeah, back to his family. He wanted me to put that in there. You know what? Just tell them I love them. <laughs> Leave it. We don't have to do it today. What are you doing? I thought maybe you could warm my feet. <laughs> Mike knows they cannot survive much longer. He also knows that it's up to him to find a way out.
I knew every time I put those boots back on, I was taking some already frostbitten tissue and aggravating it and, and doing damage. attempts once again to climb the ridge. I knew that um, at some point the search is going to be called off. You know, I'd already tried several times, but maybe I can try one more time and get up on this ridge. From the top, Mike hopes to get a sense of where he and Matthew are. successful, but this time I was able to get up. I was able to see a panorama. To Mike's surprise, the view doesn't reveal the ski resort. Instead, he sees a distant clump of cabins. But to go down to them might mean there was no way back up to Matthew. I had this debate. What if you go to these cabins and you get there and there's nobody there, and now you're in a worse position? And uh, the other voice was saying, well, what if you don't go? Um, what if you just stay here and die? I'm losing energy by the day. I'm getting weaker by the moment. I sort of calculated at some point I'm going to maybe go for help. It was kind of a now or nothing thing. The only way to decide this is to put this to Matthew and, and uh, see how he's with this. Matthew, listen, I've seen some cabins I think I can get to. I'm just not sure I can leave you behind. We should go. Because if we stay here, they'll just be finding our bodies. It was like he was giving me permission. Hardest decision I've ever made to leave this child of mine behind. It's tearing my heart out to do that, even knowing that it was the logical best thing to do. Mike skis down to a trail he spotted from the top of the ridge. Now I was finally getting up and doing something about this. That was an awesome adrenaline rush, if you will. Just the physical act of moving myself down this trail was carrying me along mentally as well. The 
the idea comes up to have a service of hope on the Monday, eight days after they're missing. Absolutely, it wasn't gonna be anything like a, a funeral for us. It was gonna be the last big push in the spiritual battle. Boy, I was really tired. I'd have to stop every five minutes just to catch my breath. It was a much more weakened state than I thought. But if I could just get there, there would be people there waiting for me to send help back to my son. Well, as I get closer to this village, I'm looking for telephone lines, power lines, signs that there really are people there. I don't see smoke coming out of the chimneys. I don't see any snowmobiles. All I see is animal tracks. It's pretty obvious that there's nobody there. If I can get a fire started, smoke comes out of this area that's clearly been abandoned, that'll be a sure sign to the searchers that they need to investigate. I found a box and it had one match in it. And it was like, this is my one chance. I only get one. I decided to wait and I thought, well, what's in the other cabins? I found a bottle of kerosene, but I found no matches there either. I went back, got ready to strike my one match. Every strike I took, it was fizzling and it was not igniting. And I, when I finally wore out all the sulfur on that match, it was like my hopes just fizzled with that last attempt. And, um, and I knew I wasn't gonna get that fire started. I'm tortured by the thought of, uh, of my son alone in this cave, you know, and it's dark, and I'm picturing what he's going through, and my worst fears is he's, uh, you know, maybe he's just lost it. The wildlife was pretty noisy. I just tried not to think about it as much as possible. I tried sleeping as long as I could. He wasn't there, and I was really scared. Off and on, I was sleeping, and I was in just a torment, just knowing that he was uh, in a worse place than me. such excruciating pain and I imagine what it must be like to be burned because frostbite is very much like a freezer burn. My feet had thawed and expanded to a third bigger. There's no way I could physically get these boots back on. I felt like a, a helpless child, you know. You know, I've lost control. Now I can't, I, now there's no way I'm gonna get back up to uh, to where Matthew is. There's no way I can get back. Matthew is alone in the cave. Now Mike too is trapped, alone, exhausted, and unable to move. I drifted off to sleep with this prayer on my lips, like God, just help us, because doesn't seem like anything I've done is getting it done. Two days had gone by and I didn't know what kind of mental state he would be in, let alone his physical state. I had to let him go. 
I can't take care of him anymore. I just came to the thought that I don't know what I'd do if I had to go back and face Mary without uh, Matthew with me. I'd run out of water. I grabbed a couple of pots and pans and crawled my way to the front door to just scoop some snow off the steps. of loggers has been clearing the trail of fallen branches brought down by the snow and by pure chance they stumble on Mike. There was a man at a shortwave radio, and they were telling me, well, we're in contact with these people that are out looking for your son. I knew that they were doing everything they could to go find him. It's a sea of humanity. People are just flooding around this little cabin. And I can see the sea of people parting. And they're uh, carrying this little package that was my son. Hi, Dad. Things were happening pretty quick. You know, they were getting in touch with all the embassy folks. Finally, they put Mary on, and well, I said, hey, dear, well, we've been separated a little bit, Matthew and I, but we're OK. Little did I know, she had no idea that we'd been separated for days. It was probably just as well. After an operation to remove one toe and part of another, Matthew's feet were saved. He and Mike made a full recovery. The family now lives in Colorado Springs. <laughs> 